So we continue with Prashna Paramita Hiridaya Sutra. Uh, strict translation is the Heart Sutra of Perfect Wisdom. We all know that wisdom is extremely important. Even in the ancient times, in the Greek philosophy, philosophy is, is a Greek word um, uttered by Greek philosophers uh, many, many years ago. Um, more than 600 BC ago, even more, even further than, uh, more ancient than the Buddha's time. So what's the, what's the definition, what's the meaning of philosophy? Philo means selfless love. Actually, it means selflessness, but then later it, it, it also contains and comprises the extra meaning of love. So philo, philosophy, philo is selfless love, and sophie, sophie means wisdom. So very important that we have wisdom, and wisdom is the essence of it, and selfless love is the function of it. In other words, there is the function, the use of it, and the essence of it. Because of the wisdom, you are able to render compassion, render selfless love to all humanities. So actually the, the word philosophy has a very comprehensive, very um, encompassing meaning. It means not just uh, philosophy, just uh, some, some, some thinking, no, it's, it's wisdom. And this wisdom embraces love. And this love is not only loving yourself, it's not only the one-sided love of loving, looking for wisdom for yourself, it's the wisdom that can render it to save not only of yourself, to save all humanities, to, to enrich and benefit all humanities. So it is selfless love for wisdom. So that's the definition of philosophy. So wisdom is extremely important. And this sutra is looking for selfless wisdom. This selfless wisdom is contained in the mind, in your own mind. It extends deep inside from your mind to everywhere, universally. So that's Prashna Paramita, Bora, Bora Mido, Sinjing. So we finished explaining the briefly the title. And then we also want to explain the Sanskrit word Prajna Paramita. It contains two broad meaning in there, Prajna and Paramita. So we also examine what's Prajna. Prajna, Pra means supreme and unique. Jna is consciousness and high understanding. So supreme, unique consciousness, supreme, unique understanding. Paramita has two connotations with it. If we go by the Sanskrit paramita, it means perfection. If we go by the Sanskrit of further splitting, para and mita is paramaim itta. So parama is the other shore, and itta you have you will arrive in the other shore. So that means if you follow this supreme and unique understanding and consciousness, this wisdom you will go from this shore of confusion, this shore of suffering and mental afflictions, you will go from this shore of suffering to that shore of nirvana, to that shore of the highest wisdom, to that shore of purity, to that shore of freedom from suffering. So there's the other shore, there's a shore of perfection. So by understanding this sutra, you reveal your internal wisdom, you can teach yourself, show yourself, and practice accordingly, going from this shore of confusion and suffering to that shore of understanding, that shore of perfection, that shore of wisdom, that shore of nirvana, that shore of freedom from suffering. The title of the sutra explains not only of the essence of it, also the functions of it. The function is the going from this shore to that shore the essence of it, with the wisdom, you can go there. So you need wisdom. You don't need blind faith. 
It's not, I believe in the Buddha, the Buddha will do everything for me, the Buddha will have blessings to me. It's, it's just faith. Uh, faith is okay. If I believe in, in, in God, in Buddha, I will get there. It's not that, just that. You really have to walk. You really have to go into that ship. You really have to row your boat. You really have to go to take that action of going, to go there. Not just blind, you have a blind faith and you can go there. The faith is in your hands. You got to row the boat. If you don't row that boat, if the oars are not moving, you won't get there. You won't get to Victoria if you don't row your boat. You're just sitting on a boat, you're not rowing there. Believing in the boat is not enough. Believing in Paramita is not enough. Believing in God is not enough. Believing in the Buddha is not enough. You have to row the boat. You have to walk the path. You have to practice it accordingly. So that's what we did last time. We explained Prashna Paramitta. And then we say, okay, we're rowing that boat. We're taking that Nanaimo ship to Queen, to Victoria. How do we go there? What kind of boat? What kind of ship? What is in there? How does it carry me? So what exactly? Well, we said that we need paramitas to go to that shore. Paramitas um, to go into that shore, to getting to perfections. What is this paramitta? What is this boat? What is this ship that leads us there? Would the ship lead us to nowhere? Would the ship like Titanic would sink in the ocean? What, what, what's that ship? I need to understand what that ship is all about because basically you need that ship to go there. That ship is terribly important. That's the practice. If you perfect this six behavior, habituate it so that you arrive at perfection of these six behaviors, you're getting there. This is a ship of six habituation of perfect behavior. Can you practice perfections to get there? Depends on you, not on God. Depends on you to get there. The first one, dana. Dana paramita is giving or generosity in both material and spiritual sense. Second is sila paramita, or we say morality or ethics or discipline. Third, zanti. These are Sanskrit words. Zanti paramita, patience, tolerance, and endurance. Fourth, virya. Virya is vigor, mental strength, diligence, enthusiasm, Fifth, dhyana, in the Pali word, jhana, but in the Sanskrit word is dhyana, which is meditation or concentration. Sixth is prajna, paramitta, which is perfection of wisdom. So you need these six characteristics, the features on this ship taking you to Nanaimo, taking you to onshore, to Nirvana. This ship contains these six practices. So in other words, if you want that ship to, to steer in the right, in the right course, Without sinking, you need to drive with these six perfections. Practice every day in order to have a perfection so that you can get onto that shore, that shore where the Buddha landed 2,600 years ago. Freedom from all suffering, freedom from life and death, freedom from samsara. And the, the Buddha wanted us to follow the same way, to follow these six perfections. Maybe we'll spend five minutes just to briefly ex examine all these. Dana is generosity. What does dana include? Material generosity and spiritual generosity. Material generosity is to give, in giving your possessions, giving out. The motive, the final motive of giving is what? Is letting go. Letting go of your attachments, your attachment to possessions, to material possessions. Everybody is looking for wealth, status, reputation, money, materials, you name them. Giving, the underlying motive is letting go of your attachment to possessions. Your happiness is not in possessions, material. Your happiness is in letting go. But we're just working in the topsy-turvy way. We thought that happiness is acquiring. 
getting more and more, more and more. But what's happiness is not in getting, it's in giving. When you're giving it all out, you'll find out that your, your life is very simple. You don't need that much. You confront it with, a, with a, a pompous meal, delicious meal. You have a lot of courses, dishes in front of you. How much you can eat? Maybe one mouthful of one dish and you got all full. You don't need all of that. And when you digest it into your stomach, it all becomes something that you don't want when you vomit it out. You don't, you don't need that much. But people just want to get more and more and more and more. So giving out material, letting go in the material sense. And what about in the mere spiritual sense? In the spiritual sense, giving out is giving out your counseling, giving out your advice, giving out your compassion, giving, giving out your loving kindness, not just to your family members, not just to your relatives, to all beings, to all animals. That's why abstain from eating meat, abstain from killing animals for food. You don't need to. You're just inflicting pain to get your own pressure in eating, in tasting, satisfying your taste buds. You know what did you do in satisfying your taste buds? Actually, you're just satisfying your taste buds, even not in the stomach. Your stomach would accept whatever you're eating, but you just want to satisfy your taste buds, and for that reason, you kill for many, many years since birth. You kill animals for food. You kill them for fur, for leather. You don't need to. So Scylla, what is Scylla? Scylla is ethics or morality. What is the underlying motive for morality? The underlying motive for morality is to reduce suffering, is to reduce as much as possible or to eliminate unwholesome karma. Why did different individuals encounter different fate? Some people have better health than others, some people look better than others, and some people have a, have, a, have a temperament better than others. Why are people different? Because people have different karma. And most people, most of us have unwholesome karma, more than wholesome karma. That's why we suffer. That's why we get fear, jealousy, hatred, all kinds of sickness, sicknesses. Why? Because we created unwholesome karma not of this life, in our previous lives, and we carry the effect of this unwholesome karma down to this life. That's why we are suffering. How come some people have better marriages than the others? Some people have better children than the others? Some people were born in a poor family. Some people were born in a rich family. They don't have to worry about looking for material acquisitions. They don't have to worry about that. When they create unwholesome karma, what's the effect? induce sufferings upon themselves. So morality, you raise a morality is you know what is right, right and what is wrong, then you reduce your unwholesome karma, which reduces your suffering. And if you do further dana, giving out this philosophy of thinking to others, you're helping others to reduce their suffering too. So there's Scylla morality standard. So one cannot be on the right path of sainthood, on the right path of perfection of wisdom, without observing a high morality standard. Zanti, if you want to get onto that ship, that ship of perfection, you can't just stay there for one day and you step back. Or you stay there for a few minutes and you get down on the gangway onto the pier. You don't want to be on there anymore. Because when you get into the ship, you see all these things, all these practices you have to do, you get scared off. You don't want to do any, any further. You want to just walk, want to walk down the gang, gangway onto your own shore of confusion. You need tolerance, endurances, patience to carry on your practice. You can't just practice for one day and you leave it for 30 days, for three years, and then you have suffering, and then that reminds you of practice again and you practice again. You have to do it like in a habituation, day by day practice. You practice one day of giving, and the other day you practice, what do you do? You practice getting, acquiring, getting more. So you always do things in a different opposite way. We thought the opposite way is the better way. So you need patience and, and, and tolerance to carry on the practice. Next, 
Viraya is vigor and mental strength. You need to work hard at it. You practice one day and, and you leave it aside for a few years, for a few days, and take it on again. If you don't practice every day, you don't have the strength, the mental strength to carry on. You cannot just practice one day or practice half a day. Dhyana, you need to have the concentration. So in other words, you need the meditation to strengthen your willingness, to strengthen your spirituality to carry on. Because you need that to strengthen your internal yearn, your internal desire for getting on that ship, for practicing it, for getting in that shore of nirvana. It's meditation. You so that you won't be distracted by it. Because if you don't have the meditation, giving the world of luxuries, the world of alluring your, your attention, given that everything attracts you, you need that meditation, the concentration to be abstaining from that kind of attraction, to avoid that kind of seduction. You, you need to avoid that. You need that concentration. And finally, prajna, perfection of wisdom. You need wisdom to practice patience and tolerance. You need wisdom to practice vigor. You need patience to practice meditation. Everything you do in morality, in generosity, you need wisdom as a guide, as a compass to guide you to do the right generosity, to guide you to do the right sila, the ethics. For example, in sila, you'll be coming across someone who practiced meditation and they told you, well, um, cows have a lot of strength. Elephants have a lot of strength. They're all vegan. And uh, why don't we try eating grass? and not, not the stable foods we have. Eating grass could give you a lot of strength, and don't eat anything else, just grass. And you wind up eating grass, and wind up get heavily sick, and you almost died. You don't have wisdom. You thought that cows have strength because of eating grass. So you need wisdom to guide you. You need wisdom to guide you in your diet, that you have the right diet, you have the right strength, to guide you to the practice. You need wisdom, you need prajna. And some people can tell you, okay, well, sila and precept, well, if you fast for a month without eating food, you may be having better concentration and meditation, but you don't know how to fast. You just fast for a month and you almost die in the first seven days, you almost died. So you need wisdom to guide you. If you're in a country if your country is being attacked by another country and the armies are marching ashore and they are ready to occupy your city and when they occupy the city there could be a lot of plundering a lot of raping a lot of destruction they are planning on that and you know about that and you say oh i i, I can tolerate it take the patience and tolerate and endure this kind of, this kind of uh, 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 attack. I don't, want to, I, I don't want to counter attack because I don't want to use violence against, uh, against violence. I just sit there and let them go ashore and maybe I can use non-violence to combat this violence. It all depends. If this troop is marching in and occupy the city and a lot of people is going to be, get hurt, you're going to organize a troop to safeguard your city, to make sure that they don't enter the city, to plunder, to loot, to rape. So you use, you gotta use your wisdom. You may even sacrifice your life to safeguard your city. You, you use the right prajna, not just endurance, endurance, what or what, no matter what. Gandhi is using non-violence against violence because he considered the circumstances at that time. The circumstances that other statesmen were in the parliament talking about violence and non-violence, the philosophy of colonizing colony. Should they continue to make colonies of another foreign country? Is it right? Is it equal? Humanity, freedom. So when Gandhi is using non-violent, peaceful means sitting in there against violence, 
that's a special circumstances there's a lot of wisdom involved in using non-violence against violence not just blindly using non-violence against violence so you need prajna for every one of these the foundation of that ship is prajna the foundation of that ship is the structure of the ship you need to build a good structure and you need to pay attention to every details of that structure you need to make sure that all the lifeguard boats are there enough for everybody not like in a Titanic where you have a luxury ship and you forget about the sufficiency of the lifeboats you can only save a few people because you thought that this lifeboat shouldn't be on the ship to obstruct the the artistic look of the ship you only pay attention to the luxuries of the ship you don't pay attention to the safety and security of the ship so you need everything on that ship to go to Nirvana lacking one of these will not work especially lacking prajna especially lacking a foundation the security the safety we're talking about prajna paramita hiridaya the third word hiridaya and hiridaya we always refer it to as the heart so let me tell you the heart sutra is not talking about the physical heart it's about your mind in common English we say we like to convey our heartfelt condolences to your family our heart, heartfelt care for your family heartfelt is not just heartfelt it's the mind felt how can the heart feel anything the heart only works as a pumping station certainly it won't think for you it won't create any emotional feeling for you it's your mind not, not your heart so when you say hiridaya hiridaya heart is just a similar limb for mind and how many kinds of mind that we have what, what minds that we have have you ever understand your own mind have you ever tried to understand your own mind this sutra sets to teach us to understand our mind to have a better understanding of ourselves how our mind works so this sutra is about your own mind when you fully understand yourself you understand others so you're always talking about hey, do you understand me you don't you understand my feelings how your feelings comes out this is the sutra that help you to understand your feeling your emotions your mental afflictions your care your heartfelt compassion this is just the beginning I haven't really finished the title of the sutra but just the title of the sutra is enough to tell us the importance and the significance of this sutra don't look for anywhere else don't look for high sounding long voluminous sutras that contains 6,000 words, 7,000 words, 10,000 words the sutras that can get you the elevation that can get you the supernatural power get down to earth get onto this ship understand the structure of this ship and practice accordingly